Assalamu alaikum everyone on behalf of Islamic City uh, welcome to the 10 days of Muharram uh, that we are commemorating with uh, Dr. Aslam Abdullah. My name is uh, Muhammad Abdullah Aleem and uh, we're honored to have Dr. Aslam again. Uh, today is the seventh day uh, where we're discussing various topics and uh, today's topic is the martyrdom of uh, Sumayya uh, bint Khayat uh, who is considered the first martyr of Islam. Uh, and uh, uh, I'll hand it over to Dr. Aslam. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Aslam. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank so you very much. The first question would be, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Aslam, would be, why are we discussing martyrdom? Uh, I think uh, if, uh, if we recite or if you play the Quranic verse, that would explain to us uh, what really it is all about. Uh, these are verses uh, uh, 154 to 157 from the second chapter, Surah Baqarah. Yes. وَلَا تَقُولُوا لِمَنْ يُقْتَلُ فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتٍ بَلْ أَحْيَاءٌ وَلَكِنْ لَا تَشْعُرُونَ And call not those who are slain in the way of Allah dead. Nay, they are living. Only ye perceive not. And surely we shall try you with something of fear and hunger and loss of wealth and lives and crops, but give glad tidings to the steadfast. الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون. Who say, when a misfortune striketh them, Lo, we are Allah's, and lo, unto him we are returning. Such are they on whom are blessings from their Lord and mercy. Such are the rightly guided. Now you can understand the status of those people who give their life in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As he reminds us that they are alive but we do not perceive. So the one that we are going to talk about today is exactly the one who lost her life, gave her life some seven years before the Hijra. But in the 1442 year of Hijra, we still commemorate her we still remember her. We still find inspiration from her story. And we still dedicate our efforts to her as well. That is what it means. That they are alive. They are alive in the consciousness of Muslims. They are alive 
in as a living example for those who did not care for their lives. And at the most difficult time and the early stages of Islam, they stood their grounds to set the examples. That commitment to God is not a child to play and it should not be abandoned because of the circumstances. Sumayya bin Khabbat. It is Khabbat. Uh, she was a slave of Abu Hudayfa ibn al ughayra And this Abu Hudayfa ibn al ughayra was a member of the Meccan clan. Dr. Aslam, before you start, would you like to play the video first? That uh... Yes, that, I was coming to that. that uh, okay. So what basically would happen is that when she offered her life, and as we will see her life, uh, we will see this clip, short clip that is from this movie, Message. And elsewhere also you can find this one. It describes the way the claim of what she calls the leadership of, of Quraysh used to persecute her and then finally killed her. So let's let's look at this clip, short clip. Yeah, so uh, just a, a short uh, reminder for everyone. It's, it's, it's a graphic uh, uh, clip uh, which shows uh, some violence. So before I play that, just wanted to make sure that people know that this is what we'll be playing. Your turn. Stretch her. Who is your God? Answer me! Say it! Say who is your God! Say it! There is only one God. And Muhammad is the messenger of God. This is a, what you call the depiction of the historical event that took place in the seventh year before Hijra. And that was on the sixth year of the Prophet Sallallahu mission. Sumayya bin Khabbat was the seventh person who had accepted Islam. And prior to that, her master, Abu Hudayfa ibn al mughira had married her to Yasir, who was from Yemen, Yasin ibn Amir, who was from Yemen, and who came to Mecca to look for a lost brother. And then he decided to settle under Abu Hudayf 
his protection. And when Abu Hudayfa married uh, her to Yasser, he said that she was the most chaste woman and the most pious and a lady with character. She's also the uh, mother of Ammar, who lost his life or who offered martyrdom in a battle uh, some uh, 30 years or 40 years later. Now, at certain point of time, Abu Hudayfa uh, freed both of them, Sumayya and Yasser, and, but they remained his clients. And as uh, was mentioned, that she was the seventh person who accepted Islam because her son had accepted Islam and the son somehow convinced her and his dad that this is the right faith because it's the faith of people who believe uh, in one God and who act on the basis of their belief. We find earlier reference of Sumayya in the book of uh, Sirah of the Prophet Ibn Hisham, Ibn Ishaq's book that was later on compiled by Ibn Hisham, even though his name is not, her name is not mentioned there, but the events are mentioned in the story of Tabari also, we find that re reference to, 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 to her. And then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a special place for Sumayya and for Yasser and for Am Ammar. He would often visit the home of Sumayya because they were undergoing the persecution as you must have seen in that clip. And he would always uh, uh, pray for them. And in fact, uh, 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 he also uh, would pray for their place in Jannah. Now, many of the people who had accepted Islam were the former slaves. And the chiefs of Mecca had difficulty in torturing or in persecuting the people who had come from the freed tribes of Quraysh. Even though they were still making uh, life difficult for those Muslims who had come from other tribes, but they were more harsh to slaves and the people who they considered as lower ranked people. And it so happened that the Yasser, Sumayya, and Ammar from that family. We are also told that the Prophet ﷺ was so much in awe of this particular family that whenever he would uh, remember Ammar, he would always remember Ammar by the name of his mother, Ammar bin Sumayya. Usually, the practice is that you would name a person by uh, his father's or her father's name. But Prophet ﷺ also, at one point of time when the Prophet was there, after he had noticed that they were beaten and they were tortured by uh, uh, the chiefs, he turned uh, his face towards the heaven and said, oh Allah, have this family under your protection. All I did all I could for them. It's you, you placed them in paradise. And uh, one day, Ammar said to the Prophet, O Messenger of Allah, the torture of my mother by polytheists had overstepped the, the limits. And the Prophet said, Patience. O Abu Yaqsan, it was the kunniya of Ammar, and then prayed for him. O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do not burn them in your fire. Do not make them an object of this kind of persecution. And then finally, you know, we'll come to that story of Yasir that who was uh, tortured uh, and uh, uh, to death. 
before his wife, before Sumaya, but we are taking Sumaya first because she is the first woman martyr in Islam. And she, as you must have seen, that she had a choice to either reject Islam, but she preferred death over that, that choice. Uh, now let's uh, look at some of the things. And of course, then, then you can have some questions and answers about uh, those things. But what do we learn from her struggle and for her death? The first thing is that we learn resilience. As early as in those days, the number of Muslims were only 30. And when the persecution was at its peak, the Sumayya of Yalukana showed that it is a state of mind. Resilience is a state of mind. And one must be prepared to face the consequences of one's action. One must not cry, one must not shout, one must not complain. You know, at the time when uh, she was uh, killed, she was uh, around 60, uh, to call uh, five? Yes, she was 65, an old woman. A frail woman, she was not, uh, you know, um, someone who had uh, extraordinary physical strength, a frail woman. But she had that kind of uh, uh, resilience. She was stable. And uh, uh, this is the quality that we find in the books of psychology later that once you have the resilience you can fight all uh, the the ups uh, uh, all the downs in you the second thing that we learn from the story of uh, sumaya is the positive attitude she was open to the idea of islam the story goes that uh, Ammar bin Yasser used to go to Darul Arqam almost every night because at that particular time it was not easy for the believers to uh, go to the Prophet and learn from him during daytime. So they would go secretly to Darul Arqam to listen. And the parents, both Yasser and uh, Sumayya, noticed that the sun was coming late and they were worried about him, as any parent would. So one day they woke up late at night to confront him. So when he came back in the uh, later part of the night, they both were awake. And they asked him where he was. He got caught. And he said he was with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then they were still pagans. So they repeated the argument of the Quraysh, the chiefs. So this is a man who is against our tradition. This is a man who is basically challenging the status quo. This is a man who is cursing our gods and all those kind of things. And uh, Ahmad stood up and he said that he's a good man. He asks us to take care of the widows. He asks us to take care of the orphans. He asks us to believe in our own strength rather than relying on someone else. And both of the parents, they immediately found the truth in his words and they, they said, he's a good man and you should follow him. And then they also became Muslim after learning more about it. So they had this positive attitude that whenever they found anything good coming, they accepted it. They didn't bother whether the son was giving the advice or the elders were giving the advice, as long as the advice was sound and made sense. And they 
repeated what they had heard about the Prophet, but they never acted on the basis of that negative idea of the Prophet. And as soon as the good was presented to her, she accepted it. The third quality that we find in the character of Sumayya radiyallahu was the perseverance. That uh, he kept going. Obstacles after obstacles, and nothing would stop her. And she encouraged others to do as well, especially her family members. So the message that she left for us, Mal Ahayam, they are alive, that in this struggle for dignity, in this struggle for placing the words of God at a higher that is still one should be ready to persevere. Then the fourth quality that we discover was the quality of determination. She stood up for her beliefs. Against all criticism, against all the majority, 30 people in a population of 7,000. Not even 0.5%. But she was drawing strength for her determination from her resilience, from her positive attitude, and from her perseverance. And now she has patience. And uh, she put up all the uh, hostile attitude of others towards her and her husband. She is a role model, indeed, uh, for not only for her family, but for everyone who wants to stand up for the truth. She was wise, intelligent, and selfless, and she ultimately sacrificed her life. So you could see the quality of the life that she lived. Well, I am there alive, and, and she is alive in that sense. Even though we rarely talk about all these heroes in that perspective, we sometimes uh, talk, they, they, you know, them as stories. But they are not stories only. And they are a, 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 an example of courage and determination for us to stand tall in all times. So I think. Uh, that basically describes what uh, what the strength of the character of Sumayya Rabi Allah Ta'ala is all about. Excellent. So um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, of course, uh, 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 some, uh, Sumayya Rabi Allah uh, Anhum was a, was a slave. So, uh, how did the slaves react? Uh, they were being targeted by the by the Makans specifically, but yet we see that it was initially all the slaves who were accepting the prophet. Yeah, the initial ones, of course, was Abu Bakr ta'ala, Ali ta'ala, Khatija ta'ala, Abdullah ibn Masood ta'ala, and they were, you know, the people from the higher tribes. But Bilal Rabi Ta'ala and Sumayya and Yasser and many others accepted Islam from that, those ranks. And they were persecuted uh, for, for their belief because they were considered as properties. They were considered as chattels. And uh, what they would do that they, the, the, you know, the owners and the masters would put the armors and iron armors on these slaves and would make them stand in the scorching heat of Mecca. So you can imagine what kind of, uh, uh, you know, the conditions they were, they were denied water. So they were, all those things would happen. But somehow that idea that the Prophet Wasallam had given initially struck in their mind. And that idea was equality. And the idea was that all human beings are equal and no one should 
ever dominate others on the basis of their status, on the basis of their culture, on the basis of their tribe, on the basis of their power. And, you know, who else would appreciate freedom than those who are in a state of slavery? Who else would stand for freedom who have all through their life lived under the bondage? So they thought that it was their only chance to liberate not only them, but their future generations. They were perceptive. They were not only thinking about themselves, but they were also thinking of a future where their generations could at least live with freedom. And Sumayya radiallahu knew that if the bondage of slavery is not broken down in that particular time, then certainly we, they would never be able to do that. Because we find that the slavery was rampant until the middle of the 19th century, or even by the middle of the 20th century. Only in 1948, we heard from the United Nations that was abolished once for all in all nations. Islam did abolish it. Islam did abolish slavery right in the lifetime of the Prophet wasallam, but somehow it remained. And some people gave the explanation that yes. you know Islam did not give explicit uh, commandment uh, to abolish the slavery, yet it asked Muslims to gradually abolish it. I think this is a weak argument because we find that if it was a gradual, uh, you know. Uh, process to abolish the slavery, then it did not end until the middle century legally. Because until 1969, there were slave markets in Mexico. So somehow we missed that point from the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says that it is not appropriate for any human being to enslave anyone else once the book has come, once the prophethood has come, and once the wisdom has been given. So this was the only hope in Sumayya radiallahu I mean, imagine you know, how many women were there at that particular time of those 30 people. Khatija radiallahu ta'ala was the first one who accepted Islam among women, and Sumayya was the second one who had accepted Islam among the the women. The second person. They could not lay their hand on Khatija because she came from a high background and they knew those claims that there would no one would stand for them. Prophet Sallallahu stood for them. But how could those uh, 30 people face the entire thing? They took a position they identified with them, they supported them, they took care of their families and all those things. They even paid for the liberation of those slaves. But the persecution was at worst. And what basically we should always remember that we are standing tall if we are standing tall, it is the sacrifice of Sumayya. It is the sacrifice of Yasser. It is the sacrifice of Omar. It is the sacrifice of Imam Hussain. It is the sacrifice of Hamza. No one gave them the pearl of the heart medal. No one put their uh, in a pictures in their uh, palaces. No one hold anniversaries about them. We remember every day because this is how the Quran promised such people that they would always be there in the consciousness of the people, in the memory of the people, and they would continue to inspire everyone until the eternity of what they did. Right. So uh, I guess this is how we can connect the dots between the martyrdom of, uh, of uh, Sumayya and the martyrdom of Imam Hussein. You know, that uh, 
uh, for slaves like Sumaya, uh, they preferred death and they preferred martyrdom uh, than subjugation, which Indeed. was such a uh, overt subjugation, accepted subjugation. And then uh, Imam Hussein, uh, who was a free man, but yet he gave his life because in a sense, he also did not want to be subjugated to an authority like uh, like Yazid and the yes. despotism and the oppression that uh, Yazid stood for. Yes. So, um, you are absolutely in fact, right. Imam Hussein gave his he gave his life for people like this also. In, in the, indeed, it, it is you know in the it, to revive the memory, but we must make a distinction between two types of martyrdom. One, fighting against those people who wanted to annihilate the faith altogether, who never claimed that they were Muslims, who never claimed that they believed in that those ideas. But Imam Hussein took a much more difficult position in the sense that he stood up against those who were claiming that they were Muslims, they were following Muslims. Because this kind of uh, uh, stand is always difficult to take. When there is a clear cut you know, demarcation between right and wrong, between the, uh, Islam and uh, uh, non Islamic faith, you take the position based on the values. But when it comes here, you take the position based on your understanding of the Quran and application of that understanding at a time not to disturb the unity of Ummah, not to all those things that usually we are asked to uphold. So that distinction should be there, but the important thing is that we uh, should remember uh, when we remember Imam Hussain, all those martyrs also who died for their cause. The picture, can you talk, talk about this picture? What is this, please? Can you describe? Uh, the, this, is, this is the cemetery in Makkah, Jannat al Mawla. Uh, and uh, this is where most of the Sahaba who died in Makkah are buried. Um, I, I did not find any specific reference as to where uh, 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 Sumayya Raziyatala Anhum was was buried, but most probably she is buried uh, in this cemetery in Makkah, Jannat al Mawla. Yes, it is. It is possible because I think the the grave of Fatiha Raziyatala Anhum was also somewhere in, within the vicinity. It is not. I mean, that place was not very far from uh, the the Khan Kaaba from the from that. Yes, it's, now, it's close to... It, yeah, it is not now in that kind of uh, shape. This is an old picture, right? This is an old picture where they had actually shrines uh, for the different people who were buried there. And they're under the renovation. Uh, uh, you know, all of these shrines uh, have been removed and now they're just graves and uh, uh, a lot of people's uh, graves who are marked also, they were erased. Uh, but uh, yeah, this is an old uh, picture of before the current uh, yeah. uh, re renovated uh, graveyard is there. So, so I think uh, that brings us to uh, yes. the and and uh, just Again, remember, you just remember the, the 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 person who is responsible for her um, uh, death. It's Abu Jahl. Right. right. Yes. So with that, let's uh, we can conclude with uh, uh, with dua, and then tomorrow you're going to cover uh, the martyrdom of uh, of Yasser. Yes, so tomorrow we will we'll cover Yasser, yeah. and and yeah. inshallah we will. Then the next day we'll cover uh, Imam Hamza, and the last day we will. Let's talk about justice and slavery in general, so that the confusion, and I'm glad that you brought up the issue of slavery because it is crucial for our understanding of the Quranic message. Bless the departed soul who died in your cause. 
and plus the departed souls. Mother Sumaya who gave her life for the deen and stood her crown. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the same perseverance, gave same determination, same resilience, and same clarity of mind on our teeth. Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Izzati Amma Yusifun. Wassalamu ala al-Mursaleen. Walhamdulillahi wa